let's go through each of the tests, and then I'll do a separate video on actually interpreting them. So starting with the intrinsic pathway, I'm going to start with PTT. And a few things to mention, PTT and PT and TT, not ACT, these are all automated tests, meaning that we add in uh, very, within the reagent sort of everything except we're testing. And so you need either a, a big fancy instrument, there are some handheld instruments that actually um, do the PT, PTT test. So when we talk about ACT, that's a little bit different. So these are not very sensitive tests, meaning that it takes a lot of absence of factor in order for them to prolong. So the PTT is prolonged, and so essentially what you're looking for is prolongations, meaning it takes a longer time for the blood to clot. So you see an increase in PTT when there's greater than 75% loss um, of factors within the intrinsic or common pathways. So that means that up until that, you don't expect your test to be prolonged. So you expect it to be prolonged when any of these factors or any of these factors are impacted, meaning that they're decreased in amount within the blood. So PT is the same, except it works on the extrinsic pathway and the common pathway. So this means that PT will be prolonged when there's greater than 75% loss or absence of factors in the extrinsic. My handwriting is getting messy, sorry about that. So greater than 75% loss of factors in the extrinsic or common pathways. So it could be any one of these are absent or diminished and you will uh, you can have a prolongation in your PT. So thrombin time is a little bit different and we don't really talk about factor amount. It's really just a test of how much fibrinogen you have. It's kind of a non-quantitative test and whether or not it functions. So it has everything to do with the a sufficient amount in function of fibrinogen. And if your fibrinogen is not working very well because of something called DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, your thrombin time can increase. We can now actually measure fibrinogen in an easier way. Um, and so thrombin times often, often are not done and we'll rarely talk about it. The last test, at least on here, is the ACT, and the ACT tests the intrinsic and common pathways similar to the PTT. However, this is not an automated test. It's essentially a gray top tube, so if you've ever seen one of those, so there's a tube, and it would have a little gray top to it, right? So that's what a gray top tube is. And it has in it some diatomaceous earth, which acts as an activator for clotting. Um, similar to other intrinsic activators of clotting. And those include negatively charged substances, such as exposed collagen, potentially, or platelets, versus the extrinsic side, which is um, sort of encouraged by release of tissue factor from damaged tissue. Anyway, the, within the ACT is this diatomaceous earth, and you put in whole blood, you wait for a little bit, and then you keep it warm, and you check it every five seconds for clotting meaning that it's essentially you're testing those two sides, but it's a kind of a crude test, and it takes greater than 95% um, absence, so greater than 95%, if this would write, there we go, loss or absence um, of factors in the intrinsic or common pathway. The other time it can decrease is because, again, it's everything. Normally in our PT and our PTT, our reagents contain things such as platelet phospholipids and platelet phosphates. And so in our ACT, remember, you have to build coagulation and kind of a platelet background, back, um, backbone. So if your platelet count is less than 10,000 per microliter, that can also prolong your ACT. So again, prolong means all of these will be increased. 
So the last thing I'm going to mention is fibrinogen. And so we've talked a lot about fibrinogen and ruminants and in large animals and that it increases with inflammation and dehydration. But you can see that it's actually a clotting factor and there's a lot of overlap between clotting and inflammation. We'll talk more about that in the next video. And so when you uh, measure fibrinogen, you can do it by a heat precipitation method. And this you can actually do in practice. Or you can send out blood for automated methods. And so the heat precipitation method has actually a margin of error of around 300 milligrams per deciliter. And you essentially take uh, some plasma, right, in a purple top tube. So you spin down a microhematocrit tube from anticoagulated blood, spin two of them down, and then you, so right, so you have your red blood cells here, and then you would have your buffy coat, and then you would have your plasma on top. So you spin that down times two, and then you would warm it in a in a heat bath, essentially, you'd recentrifuge it, and it would essentially precipitate out the fibrinogen. You would then spin it down again, and then you would measure the total protein in both. And the difference would be the fibrinogen. So it's a very insensitive measure, and that's where you actually get fibrinogen. You can do it in practice, and you may practice it potentially uh, in other, I don't know, in large animal, although they use automated methods out in your Bolton Center. Most are automated, though, um, that you might send off, and they do use automated methods out at New Bolton Center.